Fireside Chat, Episode 12, The One Without Dan, recorded April 9th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Welcome back for episode 12 of Fireside Chat. Dan can't be with us this week, so it'll be just Matt and Lucas. It's been an interesting week in Flames Hockey, seeing the debut of Max Reinhardt, as well as the return of Sven Berchi and Roman Horak to the lineup. These topics and many more will be discussed later on in the show, but first over to Lucas for the entomology of our name. Basically, uh, I, thought I'd, I thought I'd start off telling you a little bit about the show itself, because up until now we've just sort of been uh, voices in the on the internet talking about uh, a team and you know wh- why listen to us you might ask well for starters uh we've got a really clever name with historical significance matt were you aware of this yes i was were you aware of this prior to when i told you 90 yes, seconds ago awesome well I imagine, well, I'm sure most people, listen, well, some people listening might be aware of it, but a little bit of background. FDR, during the Great Depression, he was president, by the way, for those of you unaware, read a book. Um, FDR used to give weekly radio addresses called Fireside Chats, basically to, you know, let the people know what was going on and to calm them down and make them feel like the sky wasn't falling. And, uh... This was during the Great Depression, by the way. Yes. FDR, interesting to note, only three-term president. Uh, Wasn't he a four-termer? He might have been. Yes, he died in his fourth term. He was elected three times. Clearly. Uh, And then afterwards, they were like, yeah, we should probably have a rule where you can't just be president forever. Yeah, they uh, had a gentleman's agreement uh, because George Washington only served two terms that every president after that only served two terms. And it wasn't until FDR just kept going because of the beginning of World War II that they he decided to stay on. Gentlemen's agreements, by the way, first came to my attention in the uh, last lockout when the Calgary hitmen, there was a big discussion on whether or not they should fly for their games in Brandon. And it was revealed, oh, there's a gentleman's agreement that we don't fly. And it's just like, eh... All right, if it's if it's good enough for the for the United States, it should be good enough for the dub. Well, enough of the history lesson. Now on to the Flames' future. Oh, Sven Berchi's playing for us again. How how cool is that? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Him yeah. and Reinhardt, Horak, Blair Jones is back. Oh, yeah, Blair Jones, because we never needed centers in the at all in the time that Blair Jones was not on this team. No. We had too many. Yeah. Well, Blake Como's face-off percentage was a sparkling, what, 46? Yeah, yeah. that's super awesome. I'm making up that stat, I don't know. I just know Blake Como's not a center. Blake yeah. Como's in the NHL because he played on the wing for a year with one of the best centers in the game. Maybe he learned something via osmosis. You never know. Mm-hmm. Um... So, how do you think uh, Sven and uh, Reinhardt have looked since they've been returned? Which is, granted, all of two games for Max Reinhardt and one game for Sven Berge. Well, uh, for Reinhardt, he looks like uh, very similar to Eric Nystrom when he first came into the league. Not going to blow you away, but you can see elements of the game there where he could eventually develop into a really good third, fourth line guy. I, I agree completely. I look at uh, I look at Reinhardt and I think that's exactly who you should be getting in the third round. Um, not whatever. I think Eric Nystrom was what eleventh overall. Like he, he was some ridiculously high pick for what he ended up being. But if you go back and well, look at that draft, it wasn't very good. Yeah, well, realistically, he was probably the best player at the, that particular time in the draft. Yeah, yeah, like, you can look at guys that are drafted, like, eight or nine picks below, but that 
you know, at the time that would be considered a reach, so it's not really fair. <laughs> no, not at all. And if memory serves me correctly, in that draft, the only player, you have to go, I think, midway down into the second round before you find a player like, oh, well, maybe we should have taken him, and it's Duncan Keith. Yeah. But, you know, everyone missed on that several times, so how, how much can you really beat yourself up about it? Um, Reinhardt looked... I thought, admittedly, in a in, you know, he was getting way too way more ice time than he'd usually deserve, I'm sure. But uh, nothing about him said that he's not an NHL player. No, and yeah, you know, like he was a little bit out of position because normally he's a center and he was playing wing in the first game. But you know, he was delivering hits and playing somewhat responsibly, especially for a rookie. You know, and it takes time to learn the game at the NHL level, so, you know, he did good for what he's done thus far. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that he starts his career out with a minus one, but I mean, you know... He's, yeah, well, he's, that he's, wasn't really his fault, though. That was Giordano pinching. No, that was a god-awful pinch. Like, I, I saw that, and even though I don't usually uh, pick up on obvious mistakes that quickly while watching the game... I'm just sort of like, why'd you do that? This isn't going to work out. And then Dan Hamhues, back of the net. Yeah. It's like... By the way, Como, you are one point off. He had a 45% rating. Oh, my God. See? That's impressive. That close. That, 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 yeah, that's a foul tip at least. Yeah. Maybe an infield single. Sven, Sven. Let's talk about Sven. Uh, he's looking a little bit better than he was uh, in his first stint this season. He, you can see, though, when he's on the ice that he's gripping the stick a little too hard and, like, trying to do a little too much out there. And if he actually just relaxed and played his own game, I think he'd have a little more success out there. Yeah, I've uh, I've noticed that even in last night's game, the one game he's played, um, he's not doing a lot to uh, drive the play, which even though that's not necessarily his game, his game is more, you know, being in the exact right place, just knowing where to go on the ice, that sort of thing. Uh, he wasn't even doing that. He seemed very tentative until there was one shift in particular where he had, I think, Three good physical altercations. He hit Landeskog. Uh, Johnson. Yeah, and... Uh, Twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, and that, that was probably his best shift of the night. And I think, you know, it's good to see him getting power play time. Yeah. Uh, and he and looked good on the power play, for what it yeah, was worth. Yeah, it's one of those things that you can see the talents there. It's just, you know, it'll take some time for him to get, you know going again and all that. Yeah. Um, of all the pro prospects we have, he's the one that I'm least concerned about. Yeah, I have I have no reservations about him developing into at least a 70-point player, if not point-per-game, you know, first-line winger. Uh, yeah, I, I think at worst, he's basically going to be what Yuri Hoodler is, like, bare minimum four. Yeah, I, th I think if he, I think if he's Hoodler, he's closing in on a bust based on how good he can be. Yeah, like he, he's got the entire, uh, he's got the entire package. I mean, yeah, uh, I remember the day before uh, opening day, um, he was doing a drill with Backlund at center ice, just and he was, it was just basically a keep away drill and. He was deking Backlund out of his skates to the point where, like, literally, he knocked him off his feet with stick handling. Um, and you know, it's a one-on-one -on -one practice situation, so whatever. But just the the guy is overflowing with talent, and we've got to learn from the Aginla uh, era to not just have one winger and be like, okay, he's going to make everyone else better. So let's just you know, talent around him. It's all right. With no rush, they need to get help around him because he's not physically capable. I don't think of carrying the team himself. But he is your if he, if he's your one A, uh, I think you're you're in good shape. 
Yeah, and realistically, if the Flames want to be a contending team anytime soon, guys like Berchi have to be like your fourth or fifth best player. And, you know, like you need to have a lot of talent on your team. So, you know, hopefully in this upcoming draft they can get one or two guys that are on that, you know, above him in terms of talent and, you know, it's always good to have multiple options. Like if you look at LA, they got Richards, Carter, Kopitar, Brown, you know, and you can keep going for different offensive weapons. So the Flames, if they want to eventually become a cup contender, they'll need to have guys that are all doing awesome, but like having four or five of them instead of just a Ginla and, you know, some guys that are not as good. Yeah, wh whoever he happens to be making millions of dollars for next. Basically. Um, speaking of people who Iginla has made millions of dollars for, um, Alex Tongay's soul appears to have been traded to Pittsburgh as well. Yeah, I really don't know what's wrong with Tongay. Like, yes, he has scored a couple of goals in the last couple of games, but those were the only two times that he was noticeable in those games. <laughs> yeah, his play is lacking in any kind of hustle or intensity outside of very brief stretches. Even when he scored that shorty yesterday uh, against Colorado, um, he looked like he was about to fall asleep on the breakaway. Like, he yeah. waited Jaguar out so long, I thought, he's just going to fall backwards, and he's going he's gonna to be... Everyone's going to be like, oh my god, he's dead. No, he's just having a nap. <laughs> I know. I, who would have thought at the beginning of the season that, in terms of value, Alex Tangay and Matt Stajan would have traded places? <laughs> Nobody, I don't think, unless, you know... I, I think at the beginning of the year, some level, you were always thinking that, man, if we do have to trade Jerome, maybe we can get... Maybe we can trade Tangay with him, and, like, they can, you know... Work uh, on magic elsewhere? yeah. And, and clearly that, that no one was having any of that but no. not at four, four more years three more years yeah Ugh. three more years at three and a half hey, well three more years that's not so well, bad well the thing is is that he, he is leading the team in points so hypothetically at the draft if you were going to trade him teams might gloss over the fact that of his on ice play and say, oh, well, he led the team and he's only making three and a half million dollars. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Might be able to move him off anyway. Yeah. Uh, as much as I, I don't like the way he's carrying himself right now, I do wonder if, you know, you, you put, say, Nathan McKinnon in the middle and just be like, hey, yeah, Ginla's gone, but help this kid. Honestly, yeah. I think that whomever they draft with their first pick, they should just leave on their junior team or wherever they're playing and, you know, continue trading off guys, like, during the draft and next season at the deadline and, you know, come in with a fresh group before allowing those kids to come in just to get the loserdom out of <laughs> the Flames dressing room. I'd be really okay with that, surprisingly. Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen, just simply because of, I'm sure, immense pressure to ice a, I don't know, not, I don't even want to say competitive or winning, but just the, the pressure to get that number one overall pick in the lineup. And it, if you send the, fir the top pick back, it's sort of like, well, why'd you draft him? Because other guys are in the league and it's just of course you have to as an organization be able to be like look we don't think it's the best thing long term for yeah. you know well especially like when you're seeing because uh, John Gaudreau and Bill Arnold both decided to recommit to their college for another year and guys like Agostino they're going to be there too and Jankowski so like most of our key prospects are not going to be in the lineup anytime soon. So you can kind of delay a bit. So 
You could, but I wonder if that doesn't necessarily... Uh, the fact that so many of our prospects are another year away... Like, because you can't have, like, five or six rookies coming into the into the room. No. Like, the, whoever we pick is going to need to cut his teeth at some point. And, you know, help is on the way, I suppose. But, you know, they can't all be there. They can't all be going through the same rookie stuff at once. True. Well, realistically, you need a couple of decent veteran guys like Hoodler and Glenn Cross and that kind of thing. Like, realistically, the Flames are not going to be a competitive team likely for another three or four years. No. So, Um, you know, what do you do? (laughs) You know what I mean? uh, Like, there's no really definitive, oh, you must do A, B, and C. The, The whole team's a mess. It really is, and nowhere more so, I think, than on the blue line. As much as the center depth is much maligned, at least uh, in theory, if you wanted to, you could go out and sign... You could sign three top six centers this offseason and completely rebuild the center position. You could sign Derek Roy, Phil Villa, and Bozak, and you wouldn't be up against the cap. But the biggest problem... Just looking at Cap Geek, like the most desirable defenseman that I could see was Rob Scuderi. Well, Mark Streit's in there as well, and Merrick Zidlicki, both are, you know, more three four guys. But yeah, well, realistically, it doesn't help the fact that the Flames only have one guy who's playing like an NHL defenseman every night, and that's T.J. Brody. Everybody else is like playing more like a 6-7 guy. So, yeah, yeah, they got a lot of work to do. It's really frustrating because there, I think there is some merit to, I don't know, building a defense that's like, hey, let's not have a, a set number one, but let's have like six threes. Yeah. Or six three four guys. And I think you could have a lot of success with that. You might run into trouble in the postseason where you need, uh, you know, a... Uh, Sue Weber down. or Pronger or some sort of guy like that. But I think that's at least a... That's, viable. Yeah, it, Not great, but viable. It's something that provides stability. And I think more than anything, that's what the defense needs. The defense has been in flux for... Or, or just a, in shambles for three plus years now. May, maybe more. I mean, if, the last time I think they were really playing good team defense was <laughs> probably 04 well I mean they, they set the Jennings record in 05 but I mean realistically I mean I mean they played really good defense for four months under Brent when he first got here but when they were really a cohesive unit uh, it was probably um, Keenan's first year or no Keenan's second year yeah um, when Maybe, I can't remember if it was his first or second year. One at one point, Mike Keenan just decided to switch up his whole defensive system. I think it was the second year. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, and they went to a much more gap control based defense. And well, they weren't. It wasn't great. There was at least a sense of cohesion, or you know, everyone knew what more or less they were supposed to do. I don't get the sense that anyone on the back end right now knows what they're doing, except T.J. Brody. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that all the Flames' current defensemen, with the exception of Corey Sarich, are offensive defensemen, and usually offensive defensemen don't really know how to play defense too well, and, you know, when five of your six guys are, you know, somewhat weak defensively, you kind of can begin to understand why we're worse than the league in goals against. Yeah, and it it would be, I think, honestly, at least semi-acceptable if those offensive guys were actually good at doing offensive things. Um, Chris Butler, I don't know what Chris Butler is other than a good skater. Because he doesn't make good passes, he doesn't have a good shot, he's got no offensive awareness to speak of, he doesn't... He doesn't do anything particularly well except ice the puck when he's not under pressure. Um, Derek Smith has composure, but and, and Derek Smith, in my mind, is a uh, you know an ideal six. Uh, who else? Babchuk 
if you give him very sheltered minutes, he can block shots on the PK, and as we saw a couple years ago in the right role, he can put up 28 points on the power play. But he's gone, thankfully, soon. And, like, Giordano, who knows what's happened to Giordano? Like, as far as I know, he's not had a concussion, but his decision-making has just evaporated. Entirely. Like, nobody <clears throat> except TJ Brody looks like they know where to go with the puck once it's on their stick. Yeah, like, and while it's good that, you know, at least we got one guy and it's our youngest player on the defense corps, you know, it'd be a little more encouraging if we had two or three guys that actually seemed to know where they were. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I mean, or and where other people are. Yeah, like, well, like, it, it's kind of good that several of our defensemen are free agents of, well, two of them are free agents of one type or another, both Butler and Babchuk, because at least with the pair, like, honestly, I'd walk away from both and, you know, just cut your losses with Butler and... I would trade... Try, try and get something if you can, but if not, just walk away and sign somebody else that, you know, isn't... Butler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my biggest problem with Butler comes from his complete lack of jam. Or, or yeah. he, he really is, like, uh, I don't know, maybe, how do I say this? The square root of Jay Bowmeister? Just Bowmeister with exponentially less talent? Yeah. Like, just very soft, very almost skittish, but he does skate well, but he's not particularly big he doesn't have a good stick um he's just sort of there and he makes 1.25 million dollars so i guess he's valuable that way honestly i think it would be better to have kandari or breen come up when next year and take his spot even if you're worried about value for dollars because you know he it does not look like he's you know because he's 27 now it doesn't look like he's ever going to turn the corner and develop into a good defenseman. Like, I can understand why they acquired him, because at the time he was only 24, and just out of um, the NCAA, so like he wasn't like a full-time player yet. So, you know, and if he developed, that would be good, but... Yeah, it's not working out too well. <laughs> no, and more than anything, like, and I understand it's difficult in hockey with guaranteed contracts and all, but when you have a chance to cut bait, just do it. Don't worry about sunk costs. Just move on. This, yeah. Like, we, we, we really, next year, it would please me a great deal if we could have one of each type of defenseman per pairing. Like, you've got, like, a, a physical guy and a smoother skater yeah because the 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 entire team gets the defense just gets run over yeah and and we have no stabilizing forces on our team no and yeah like the opposing players just run roughshod over us and again you wonder why we've given up the most goals so. <laughs> it's it's Kipper's fault. He's a reflex goalie, and he's done. Well, yeah. it's it not doesn't bad. explain why every other goalie has had the exact same problems. <laughs> like, yeah, they're not as good, but, you know, uh, the defense and the forwards are not helping out. <laughs> no, it's... And everyone would like to... Everyone seems to... The common thread seems to be the forwards don't play good defense. Well, neither do the defensemen. No. It's like, uh, the whole thing <laughs> sucks defensively. Yeah. And, you know, the, the coaching style doesn't really help. But no. I do wonder just how much of uh, Bob Hartley's approach is based on, well, go try and, you know, we're not doing much. See what you can do. Like... Because I mean they did, but I mean they did play a decent game against San Jose. Yeah, now, that was solid defensively. They 
his wonderfully, uh, I don't know, outstanding ability to choke that away. To like, yeah. that, well, that's the sort of. Did you notice that there was a certain defenseman wearing number five that wasn't in the lineup that game? Surprising. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> are, are are you saying that? That's the res- the result of, or, or that's to blame for the late goal, or the fact that we only gave up two goals to San Jose. I'm make meaning that you know it might have been a little bit worse. <laughs> yeah, um, that's just how bad the defense has been. The whole team has been, you know. Yeah. Like, you have Brett Carson come in, and he actually looked half decent. Which you know, like that's why I'd rather see guys like Reinhardt Horak. And, like, all the kids come in and just let them learn. And, you know, because it's not like we're going to do anything for the next year and a half anyway. So just let the kids play and you never know. You might end up getting some players that can last for three or four years. You know. Mm-hmm. And I'd agree with that. And we're talking a lot about TJ Brody. And this thought occurred to me last night simply because TJ Brody, since the entire team, since the, the two biggest players on the team were removed, um, TJ Brody seems to be the only player on the roster who has really thrown himself headlong into into the challenge, so to speak. Everyone else has really... For the most part, looked really deflated. Uh, Camilleri's played with a bit of jam uh, here and there, but every most of the vets are sort of like, Ugh, oh, how many games till we get out of here? Um, T.J. Brody is playing, you know, he's playing very good. Oh, yeah, that, was, that was great, great, uh, great praise right there. But he, he's easily the most impressive player night in, night out right now, and. I, it occurred to me that if you absolutely had to name a captain for this team next year, I would be way more comfortable with a player who exudes that type of attitude and plays with that sort of intensity as opposed to giving it to Mark Giordano, who's done nothing but regress since uh, since he had that injury last year. And he wasn't playing great before the injury. Yeah. And, you know, the only concern I might have with that is that he's still learning and that might be a little too much responsibility but otherwise I think it's as good of a choice as any I mean I I agree that you know he's probably not really ready for it but I think you at least give him an A going into next year oh yeah an A for sure and, uh, like, mid-season, I don't think you name a captain until at least the halfway mark. And by then, if anyone is going to have stepped up on the current roster, they will have. You're going to know whose team that is. Mm-hmm. And if it's TJ Brody's, then, you know, TJ Brody's going to get the C. But yeah. realistically, I don't see who else you could justify giving it to. No, unless you're giving it to a guy for a season before giving it to Brody. Uh, you know, like none of the rookies that we're likely to draft or anything are going to likely come in and, you know, take the C like, you know, like Landis Cog or any of the other guys. So, why not? <laughs> you need someone to put the C on. Yeah, you do, but you do and you don't. I mean, how long did Buffalo go without a captain? It's. Are you comparing us to Buffalo? I am, <laughs> but maybe that's you know, maybe that's too harsh. Although when they didn't have a captain, they made it to the they made it to at least the conference finals. True. So that's what we need. We need Daniel Briere. You know what? That's what I'd do. I'd trade for Daniel Briere and uh, give him the captaincy right now. Yeah. I need I need someone on this team who underst- who, who, you know, can impart upon the rest of the team that winning matters and that yeah. you know, how to elevate your game or something. And I don't know how Breer does it, but it's remarkable just how good he gets when he needs to be. Yeah. Well, what we need to do then is uh, lure Gaudreau out of juniors or the college and 
uh, have a line of Briere, Gaudreau, and Camilleri with Kandari on the defense core. You know, the mighty midget line. Yes. Oh, and Kandari will be paired with Breen. Yeah, why and, not? And, and then it'll be like one sort of like... It'll be like a Mexican wrestling show. <laughs> yeah. We could call them the luchadors. Yeah. <laughs> going to be a tough road for this team. Yeah, huh. like, I hope fans are exceedingly patient, you know, because realistically, the Flames are going to not be too good until the building that they're going to be making is ready. Probably not, but what a way to open it up with a good team. Yeah. Also, uh, I was wondering, what are your opinions on the draft? Like, who we, should we take with our first pick? Because we're likely going to get one of the top four players. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's a way we finish outside the top three. Like, uh, and at this point, you know. Well, Carolina's only won one game in their last ten, so and they lost again tonight, so they're fighting to get into the top four. Yeah, Carolina's still got that. We spent so much money in the off season. We just gave seven thirty-five million dollars. Please, God, save our season, sort of thing going for them. So I don't think they're just going to roll over and quit. Especially, uh, they pretty much already have. Oh, <laughs> damn well, it, Eric! They got they got Justin Peters in that. Like, really, there's not much you can ask for. I suppose yeah. they should have made a play for Kiprasov. Why? They were already too far out of it. I suppose. It only would have cost a second. They wouldn't have gone anyway. It's not the point. Yeah. Um, Could you imagine Kipper in South Carolina? <laughs> no. I or think North Carolina, pardon me. I think he'd be very... He'd be walking around with a confused look on his face. And... As with most Canadians. <laughs> yeah. Or Although, you know what, I've, I've heard uh, North Carolina is actually not a bad place. South Carolina is all Confederate flaggy, but... Uh, North Carolina's making some interesting moves politically lately, so... Oh, really? Like what? Uh, they're trying to make things like divorce illegal again and all that. that and... That'll show the gays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! All right. Yeah. It's well, a problem when you have MSNBC on the background. <laughs> I see. Well, it takes all kinds. I suppose. Um, but to the draft, I would say, um, again, move he- heaven and earth for McKinnon. You don't even if you get first overall, it's it's McKinnon. Uh, yeah. Um, it's not Jones. Everyone who says, oh, Jones is the best player. No, he's... Really? The Chicago Blackhawks took Jonathan Taves at three. The St. Louis Blues took Eric Johnson at one. Because Eric Johnson was the best player available. Now, do you think St. Louis is really enjoying the fact that they're going to have to watch Jonathan Taves for the next ten years after he's already won a Stanley Cup for division rival? And, you know, he's going to go to the Hall of Fame one day, probably. Um, and their pick is playing for Colorado? But they got the be- the dude with the best name in the league and Chris Stewart. True. So, but even then, like, who cares? No, like, realistically, um, your top pairing defensemen, usually you can find them in the top two rounds of a draft. Like, if you look at, say, Nashville, they drafted Ryan Suter with their first pick in 03, they drafted Kevin Klein with their second pick in the middle of the second round, and then, uh, you know, some shitty player, Shea Weber, with their third pick in the, you know, in the second round. So, you know, like, you can get good defensemen. Like, they're somewhat like goalies where you you can't really specify, oh, this guy will be the good one. You know, like, they usually have some skills that are apparent right off the bat, but, you know, like, I wouldn't waste it with the guy that's going to be in the top three, 
because usually centers, they're pretty much guaranteed to be at least a second line player. Like one pl one person put a post on the Calgary Puck and they showed the top uh, 22 centers that had been taken in the last 10 years um, that were all taken in the top five and 21 of them ended up being at minimum a second line center with only Alexander Spitoff being the complete bust. Yeah, so, I saw that. Um... So, you know, at least with that, like, if, say, Drew Ann, McKinnon, or Barkoff, or even Lindholm, all of those players look to be at least a second-line center. Because Drew Ann, even though he's listed as a left winger, he was a center his entire life until he played with McKinnon, and the coach decided to move him over to the wing. <laughs> so, you know, like, you could easily shift him back as well. So, like, that's why I'm not really... I don't really care where the Flames pick as long as it's in the top five because each of those four other guys are all really good. It just depends on what you want. Yeah, I, I agree. I actually saw an Elias Lindholm highlight package for the first time today, and I was not aware just how filthy that guy is. Yeah, th like um, that's what I mean. Like all of Barkoff, McKinnon, Drouin, and Lindholm, they're all players that would have likely been taken first or second overall each of the last four years. So really, does it matter that much? You're going to get a first-line center, you know, at least for us. <laughs> yeah, um, and again, we, we've had we've had some good defense cores in the last uh, in the last ten years. What's it gotten us? Nothing. Exactly. And, yeah, like the Flames haven't had a true number one center since Newendike left. So, you know, if you can take one of those guys, you're freed up with the second and third pick in the first round to take a defenseman there or two, depending on who's available. Mm -hmm. I, I think, honestly, it, it, it would surprise me if we, if we keep all three of our first round picks because it looks like St. Louis is going to get in with room to spare. Yeah, because um, they won again tonight, and like they're six points up on ninth, so it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that they're in. Jay Bowmeister must be breathing a huge sigh of relief. He must be going, wait, all it took was me not wearing four. Yeah. <laughs> oh. 19 is the winner. Yeah. If you think about it, the last time he won anything was probably... He was on the World Cup team, and I think he wore number three. Yeah. So, oh, God, he's an idiot. <laughs> I'm superstitious, but I, I know stupidity when I see it. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, anyway, uh, three first-round picks, that's right. Um, it would not surprise me at all, especially given how many centers have first-round grades in this draft, if two of those three players aren't centers. And I don't think this is the time to joke around and go, oh, well, since we're going to take centers with picks four, 17 and 30, we're going to pick Seth Jones number one. I think you go center, center, then D, your best player, or whoever. Not yeah. a goalie. It, well, it also depends on who's available. Like, say, like, one of the top ten defensemen, like, the, you know, the guys that are going in the top ten-ish, are still there, and the defense or the forwards that you would likely look at for your second pick are gone. Well, then, sure, you know, take a look. But you know, like it would make sense, especially like if a guy like Frederick Ote was on there. Yeah, I know to, you're a big fan of him. Yeah. Well, anytime you get a guy that can skate well, is six foot five, and plays good defensively, and is not inept offensively, you know, <laughs> you you take that. And good defensively in the queue as well. That's, that's, yeah, that's and not... like, if he only develops into Martin Hansel, you know, that's awesome. You you have your new Joel Otto for the next ten years. Exactly. You know. And then that puts uh, a position, that, that puts, you know, a guy like Jankowski, who I think is, uh, and, you know, 
people might bite my head off for this. I wish they would, because then it would mean I knew people were listening. Uh, people might bite my head off for this, but I think Jankowski's only two years away. I think yeah. he plays next year and develops a more get, gets more involved in his offense. The next year after that, he is the focal point of his offense, and then after that, he's not finishing his degree. He's gonna he's gonna turn pro after the third year. That's that's my gut feeling anyway, based on him developing properly and filling out. And I assume in two years he's gonna have at least another. 15, 20 pounds on his frame, and then he can slot right into that second line center behind McKinnon or Barkov or Lindholm or whoever. Yeah. And realistically, with Jankowski, he's done a decent job with his playmaking ability. And, like, he, if I recall correctly, he had uh, twice as many assists as he did goals this season. So that is good because, like, uh, he doesn't have the weight yet to drive to the net to get his goals like he normally would. So, yeah, if he puts on some weight, you should see the goal totals increase. And, yeah, it, having a good playmaking center is, you know, nobody can complain about that. You hear that, folks? Playmaking center. Everyone who hates this pick needs to stop doing it because you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, if you've watched any of his highlights, he makes moves that are reminiscent of a guy like Joe Thornton, more so, you know, like, it's really actually impressive to see the moves he's making, considering he's 6'3 and, like, 170. <laughs> yeah, his hands, uh, in the highlights I've seen of his, are so friggin' quick. They are... I, I don't want to go so far as to call them Eberly-esque, but... Yeah. That that there it is. They're friggin' fast. Yeah. And well, some people don't realize is that he was basically John Gaudreau in his high school league, and then he grew like eight inches in like one year. <laughs> so you know, like he was that speedy, shifty winger type that could snipe. So, you know, then now he's having to adjust to, you know, instead of being the small shifty guy to being the bulldog, you know, <laughs> bull through the china shop, I should say, <laughs> type of guy. And, you know, just physically being, you know, imposing instead of being the perimeter guy. Mm-hmm. Like, look at it this way, folks. It took... It took Bruce Banner three different movies and three different actors before he could finally control the Hulk. So give Jankowski some time. He's going to be fine. He's always angry. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good nickname for, for Jan... Oh, maybe it's not. Maybe we'll get the Hulk thing going when he's actually on the team. If he fights. Uh, is everyone bored? I think, think we've talked enough? Prattled on? There's only two of us, so... I need someone to stop me. Yeah, that's the thing. When you get talking hockey, you can just go on for hours. <laughs> yes, indeed. By the way, how's Marion Gabrick doing in Columbus? Have they just fallen off the face of the earth since he's been there? or? Uh, actually, he scored quite a few times. Oh, well, good for him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he scored a goal tonight in their 4 nothing shutout of San Jose. Oh, wow. Shut out the Sharks. Huh. Good for them. Good for Bobrovsky. I like I like a lot of people on yeah, he has two uh, goals on Columbus. And three, he has two goals and three assists since moving to Columbus. Wow. Who's, who was the last person who reinvigorated their career as a Blue Jacket? Uh, this is new territory entirely. I think it is. I think that... You know what? At this rate, like we're going to see a, an mm. influx of Finnish GMs. Yeah, the only guy that might have is Jeff Sanderson, but even then, you know, it's Jeff Sanderson. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Oh, Jeffrey. Yeah. He was a former whaler, now that I think about it. He was a former a lot of teams. So. I, su I suppose he was, wasn't he? 
By the way, do, do you know who the only... I believe there's only two left. Uh, although one sword, really. Um, who are technically the two uh, remaining Hartford Whalers in the league? Oh, God. Um... They sort well, of... Jaguar is one. Yeah. The other would be... I have no idea. I'll, 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 my head. I'll give you a hint. Nobody remembers number two. Yeah, that doesn't help. Okay, me. it's it's Chris Pronger. Oh yeah, well, he's not really in the league right I, I now. I know, so, so it, it, it's it, he hasn't it's filed his those, retirement papers. Well, would you? You know, you're getting paid six million dollars regardless. So yeah. Although, if I'm re- if I recall correctly, like I think the only reason he wouldn't file a retirement papers is because then it really does go on Philadelphia's cap. Because insurance would be paying his contract anyway. Yeah, and they'd have a waiver for that. Yeah, the Flyers, they have a waiver for that. So, mm-hmm. in effect, he's actually helping the Flyers by taking the money. <laughs> yeah, which indeed. Which is kind of strange and stupid, but... It's 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 one of life's little quirks. Yeah. That's a shame. I wish Chris Pronger was healthy. A game's better when he's good. Yeah. Oh, I think we've already seen the last of him. I agree. I, I wouldn't really bother coming back if I were him. It's like, what else have you got to prove? No, just cash the paychecks until you, your contract's up and then go on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not like you're paying it, so... No. Or your team's It's not even like it. they're paying it. And even yeah. if they are, it'd be like, look, you're paying Ilya Brizgalov for arguably less efficient results so yeah you know how much was that playoff run worth to you I know like that that was such a stupid contract because you could tell that uh, Breeze Galoff was a product of the Phoenix Coyotes and you know like that's why some poor team is going to end up overpaying Mike Smith and then they're going to wonder why he's a backup Mike Smith was always a good goalie, though. He, at least in Dallas, yeah. uh, he was. He, well, let, let me just say this: he was the focal point of the Brad Richards trade for a reason. But then he got a concussion. So, well, it, you know, since when has Tampa Bay made smart talent evaluations when it comes to their goaltenders? That uh, Javi Bullen was all right, but Javi Bullen was in a contract year, so I shock that more up to Javi's love of money than their. Lightning's talent evaluation. Um, which, by the way, Oilers should be in a playoff position this year. Javi Bullen's deal is about to expire. Get it together, Nick. Well, they're playing Dubnik, so yeah. that's the reason. By the way, Edmonton, you're never going to win anything as long as Devin Dubnik is your starting goalie. Uh, actually, you know... I, he gives up I'm starting goals. I'm, I'm starting to see a little bit out of him that he could be a solid lower end starter. You know, not bad, but not, you know, anything you'd want to rely on. As I said, Edmonton, you're never going to win anything while Devin Dubnik is your starter. You should upgrade this position immediately. Yeah, well, the thing is that they only have one good goalie prospect, Tyler Buns. And that's it. So they're kind of screwed. Don't they have Olivier Waugh or Mark Byzantine or someone? No, Byzantine is with Phoenix. And uh. they might have Waugh, but I don't think he's a good goalie, so... Fair enough. Well, sh- should have drafted Brassois. Maybe. I don't know. What am I saying? I'm just... I want so desperately to hate Edmonton, but I really can't because... Neither of us matter. So, you know. By the way, you were correct. Uh, he, They do have Olivier Wobb, but he's been in the ECHL. Oh, okay. So, well, you know, that's, that's what you get for ruining the World Juniors. Yeah. I like think he's still in the ECHL, so you're really not doing too good. Go, go Stockton Thunder. <laughs> okay. Good, good job with your creative naming of your cities, America. 
Anyway. Ah, all right. Well, that's going to wrap it up, I think, for us here. Now, for uh, all, uh, all your fireside chat uh, info and uh, news and uh, merchandise and uh, to sponsor children in Africa, uh, please visit ch- uh, firesidechat.ca. And, uh, we don't actually have any merchandise yet. Nor African children, but if you'd like to sponsor an African child, please do so. They could really use the help. It's not the best place over there to raise a kid. And, you know. Yeah. For 75 cents a day, you can feed, clothe, inoculate, and educate a child. And, which is a bargain, as Anthony Jeselnik says, when you think about what it costs to send them there. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong? All right, for Matthew, an absentee Dan, and myself, suck it, Tom. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.